Hey, uh, Financial Phil is via telephone joining us this morning from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Awesome possum. How about yourself? Live the dream, sir. Hey, before we go any further, tomorrow is the deadline for registering to vote in the upcoming May primary election. You can do your late registrations here in Martinsburg at 400 West Stevens Street, or otherwise you can go online at govotewv.com from the Secretary of State's website, and you can register that way too. It's easy. You can do it from your phone. Govotewv.com. Uh, Phil? Yes, sir? My man, if you'd have come in today, I'd have a piece of cherry pie for you. Mm. Well, um, I mean, before we get into the cherry pie, I did want to give you guys credit for your political forums last week. I thought that was absolutely terrific. I couldn't listen to them live, but I went back and watched them all, and I had made my mind up of who I was going to vote for based off of your forums and your questions. So I'd like to give you guys a lot of credit for that. That was cool. that was uh, really, really, really good. Now, really Phil, good. thank you, Phil. Phil, did their response have anything to do with the, uh, your decision who you're going to vote for, or just the fact that we ask a question to them? No, <laughs> uh, it was it was the questions, and of course their responses, and how they interacted with each other. And I was on the fence about a few things. Some I already knew, but I was on a, on the fence about a few things. But after I watched the the form, I can throw away the the flyers in my mailbox now. I know uh, 100% in every race that I would be voting for, who who I would vote for, solely based off of your all's form. Excellent. By the way, John Gilstrap has uh, chimed in. He said, greetings from Greece. Does the Palace Lounge deliver to Athens? The answer is no, John. They, Or if they do, by the time you get the food, you wouldn't want to eat it. Uh, another... That's a dedicated man there. <laughs> he is listening from Greece. That is dedication. He we, just we wants, appreciate that, too. He wants free food, Phil. Who wouldn't? Well, I hope he hears the credit because his questions are really good, too. I, th- I mean, I really did. I thought all three of you, on a serious, I thought all three of you guys did a really, really good job with that. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we had a question on our website in regards to guests uh, from uh, Lisa Ishman Gamber, or Gamber uh, in regards to the last segment we did and asks the question, have you granted equal airtime to another candidate, Chris Glover? And uh, actually, Chris will be on Thursday, uh, by the way. But in regards to our guests, uh, some of you might be new to the show, new to the audience, and, and maybe just not aware of what the rules are. But in regards to candidates and equal time, that applies within a certain window of time before Election Day. And uh, we, of course, abide by those rules in all situations. So if a candidate... Uh, if a, a candidate asked for uh, an interview and maybe one of the other candidates for the same office they're running for was on, uh, we certainly grant that time. We don't play favorites with candidates. We don't exclude candidates uh, who are running for office from being on the show. Uh, there is a limit. I can't have the same candidate on seven times. <laughs> you know, so, you know, but uh, certainly everybody who requests an interview during that window gets at least one here on the program. And if I have their competitor on twice, then they're given the second opportunity to come back as well. Speaking of those forums, Phil, that you brought up, a couple of folks couldn't make it to the forum. One was uh, Delegate Paul Espinosa, who's running for Senate. And as a result, we couldn't have Delegate Espinosa and Senator Rucker at the forum at the same time. So we invited them to come on the program, and they will do that in the 9 o'clock hour today. Senator Rucker, Delegate Espinosa will be in studio between 9 and 10. Mr. Cram will stay with us, Mr. Stubblefield as well, mm-hmm. and we'll conduct an interview with the two of those candidates for the uh, Senate 16th seat. Now, to money, Phil, and why the market sold off so badly last week. <sighs> it looks like it wants to rally a little bit but this morning, but we've had some of these false morning uh, futures market rallies before that have turned around to an ugly sell-off once again as the day has gone along. Why is the market so negative right now? The uh, market is negative for a handful of reasons, most of which has been happening all year long. It really, The narrative really hasn't changed, but there's one thing missing that we got early in the year that we didn't get last week. Hopefully we get this week, and that's the path of inflation. You know, we went into December, and the CPI, PPI, and the alphabet soup of inflation reports that I, I am so exhausted about talking about, but that is what's important right now. But that in December of 23, it was a little bit better than what was expected. We had a tremendous month because that led us to think that the Federal Reserve would cut rates six times in 2024. And then each and every report from there on out had not met expectations. So we've kind of got a flat line in inflation that hasn't continued to fall, which, of course, has pushed the Federal Reserve out to 
either one or two or some have even mentioned none and and lord help us if they increase rates but there's been one or two mutter that they think another rate increase is on tap so we're all over the place with what we think the federal reserve is going to do but of course that's going to be data dependent so every month that we get those reports we're going to read into that what we think the federal reserve the group of them will come up with and what their reaction to those inflation reports have been but the one thing that was missing in the, in last it's so far in april that we got early in the year which was earnings if you remember nvidia had that incredible uh, earnings report and had overnight trading increase more than the entire market cap of bank of america and it pulled a lot of companies with it anybody that was in artificial intelligence kind of got a huge boost from that and that is the part that's missing so far in april while earnings haven't been terrible there really hasn't been anything that would shock us into saying hey we need to buy into this or we need to excel into into the market now this week we do, and it's really important. I think we've got some mega caps reporting in Google and Microsoft, and uh, Netflix was last week. Net- Netflix last week confused me some because their earnings report was really good, but it got hammered after the report came out, and I think it was because they said they weren't going to count and announce new subscribers anymore. I, don't, I still don't know what that has with the overall impact of the profitability just because they're not going to count the subscribers, but it took a beating last week. Bond yields are up over 4.6 again, and so far April has been bad. And we're teetering on, not there yet, but we're teetering on going negative for the year in our in our markets. So S&P is still slightly positive, Nasdaq still slightly positive, and Dow is in negative territory. But mostly we just haven't gotten that support like we did early in the year from NVIDIA. And, Phil, we are rapidly approaching the sell in May and go away tradition for the summer. So if we are in a downswing now, it could be ugly over the summer. Well, it could. And, you know, we look at that as technical analysis. And if you follow the, and we do follow the efficient market hypothesis, that uh, technical analysis really isn't worth uh, all that much. It, it, it has happened. Uh, May tends to be one of the worst months of the year, I think. Uh, but I, I don't know that I would place a lot of stock in or buy and sell based off of that. And we, we preach this all the time, and I'm sure people are tired of hearing it as well. But here in our office on 1270 Winchester Avenue, you invest for who you are, not for what just happened in the markets. Now, that changes a little bit if you're sitting on a, a lot of cash. You know, Maybe you just sold a home and you're just sitting on cash. Maybe that would dictate how that goes into your asset allocation uh, but it, it wouldn't. We wouldn't say, "Hey, you're an, you're a conservative investor now. Be aggressive, or you're an aggressive investor now. You should be conservative based off of short-term market trends." Because here's here's another thing that's confusing. What we've seen so far in April is something that is that is seen in bull markets, and it's also seen in bear markets. So it hasn't reached a point yet where we can signify that, "Hey, this is what." These, these first three weeks of April has meant to us because we have been in a really good space market-wise since the fourth quarter of 2023, and we gave a lot of 2024 back in April, but not all of it so far. If you went back to October, it still looks really, really good, but it's still that's a part of a natural bear market, and it's also the same thing to happen when you get to a correction or a bear market. So uh, it, it still doesn't tell us anything about what's happened in April. So don't trade off of it. Of course, you got your antennas up hoping for good earnings this week. And, and of course, we would hope to see inflation readings fall more than what they have. Mr. Cram. Good morning, Phil. Um, uh, years ago, a, a friend of mine who was heavily into investing always said, don't sweat when the market goes down, buy. Uh, it sounds like good advice, but just uh, arbitrarily buying may not be the best approach. So when the market's down, should you buy? And if so, how do you proceed? That's a great question. And it goes back to what we had just mentioned. If you were setting on cash, you had just sold a home or something of that nature. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you sold a home in February and you had 
three hundred thousand. I'm just arbitrary numbers. Three hundred thousand that you've just deposited into your account here at Meriprice because markets were so high at that point, we probably would have dollar cost averaged into your regular allocation. So if your allocation was 65% stocks, 35% bonds and bond replacements, we would start to dollar cost average in at that point because the markets were so high. We wouldn't want to throw three 300000 all into a, a top-heavy market at that point. But if you, that same client came to us today, and had 300000 we will probably be a little bit more aggressive into putting it into their 65-35 allocation. The allocation wouldn't change, but we'd be a little bit more aggressive putting it in simply because we know that it's about 6% cheaper than what it was three weeks ago or two weeks ago, that the equity portion of your portfolio is much less expensive than what it was before, regardless of where it goes it's still less expensive than what it was a few weeks ago. So that's probably how we would approach that situation if they didn't have an upcoming need. You know, maybe they're buying another home or buy a motor home with that those cash flow. So we would set some of that aside but based off their short-term needs. But that's how we would approach it based on and, – and that is recency bias. But we know that, if you know, if we're at an all-time high today and you drop off a check – most likely we're going to dollar cost average that in instead of just throwing it all in at once. Bill, I, I know one thing you shouldn't be advising anybody to do is to buy Tesla <laughs> right it's, now. It's, it's, this it's, morning it's down another seven percent. It's, it's well, I'm sorry, five percent. Ready to come out this week too. If I'm not mistaken, Tesla's earnings coming out. And hey, I got a good story. I, and I, I thought this was kind of neat. I want to meet this person. But on my way into work today, I was behind a Tesla that had a West Virginia license plate on it with a deer. And I just thought that was like two <laughs> things that you don't see together. And it shows some of the diversification for Tesla. Let's build Tesla up. We've got a avid hunter, apparently, because he bought a deer license plate driving a Tesla. You don't see that every day. Can you strap your deer on the front of your Tesla there? <laughs> be like having a Prius with a Biden sticker on it, Phil. Yeah. yeah. Tesla, <laughs> Tesla is taking a beating, that's for sure. 140 a share right now. Yeah. Uh, Phil, last night on 60 Minutes, the uh, uh, head of the Department of Commerce was talking about the chip industry. And chips, of course, are critical in practically everything we do. AI, defense phone chips, everywhere you look, defense phone chips. A point that she made that surprised me was that the Chinese chips are several years behind the U.S. made chips as far as technology and capability and power and the like. Uh, but she went on to say that the, uh, uh, the chip industry uh, until very recently has been concentrated in Taiwan. Uh, with the CHIPS Act uh, last year, we have started trying to pull the chip industry back to the U.S., and the Biden administration is supporting, is uh, funding some of this. But my question is, uh, the fact that chips are so, are so concentrated, Taiwan is in such a vulnerable position. Uh, is there any concern among the investors uh, how vulnerable and how how vulnerable the industry is due to the proximity of Taiwan to China? No, oh, absolutely. And, and if we rewind back a little bit, another chip story, if we recall how expensive it was to buy uh, used vehicles and how uh, the, the supply for new vehicles really just didn't exist, and that was because we couldn't get the chips, which I think brought on that CHIPS Act and why that was so important to – find another alternative source to purchase chips. But, yeah, because they are involved in everything, and that's part of this inflation narrative that we've got right now still, where that, that imbalance between vehicles and every single thing that we wanted to purchase, like you said, it's involved in so many things that we don't even think about. You know, when you stop your car and the motor goes off and you lift off your, your gas and the motor comes back on, there's a chip that does that. But there's a chip for everything, and because of that, that's I think that's why we're so our, our antennas are up uh, with Taiwan and China, and the hopes that we can create more of those here at home, so we don't have to worry about that as much. But chip production in back to February with Nvidia chip production is very very important and used by so many different things that it, that it, it does kind of get our antennas up when we hear that sort of thing. All right, Phil. Now to the important stuff. Who were the Steelers taking in the first round of the NFL draft this Thursday? <laughs> I don't 
I have no idea, but I know that whatever I want them to do is going to be the wrong move. I still have to take credit for when they drafted Ben Roethlisberger. Man, I was mad. I was mad when they drafted that guy. I was mad when they drafted Troy Polamalu. So I better keep my opinion to myself. I just kind of hope it's an offensive lineman. I think those are the safer picks. And when you look at offensive linemen through the years that are taken early in the draft, they normally have a higher rate of success at that position than, say, quarterbacks or running backs or, or big names. Just the, the the and maybe that's a little bit of biasness on my point because I, or my part because I was an offensive lineman, but I think a center or a tackle would do them really really well. And look at our last few that we've drafted. You know, it's still the jury's out on Broderick Jones, but Marquise Pouncey and David DeCastro and those early offensive lineman picks had turned out to be uh, Alan Fenneker for that matter had turned out to be ten to fifteen year stars for the Steelers. So hopefully. They go offensive linemen, but I want to keep my opinion to myself because I see when I when I narrow in on someone, I say I want this person. I'm almost always wrong. They seem to be in love with players from Georgia lately, and that leads me to believe they're going to take that six eight three hundred and forty four pound tackle from Georgia. That's my guess right now. That's if he's thinking. available, yeah, I understand he may not be available, but we'll see. Yeah, Dylan, where are you, buddy? Uh, how about uh, Graham Barton, in, interior offensive lineman from Duke? Duke, he, Barton's also been talked about. And they, they need a tackle, yes. and they need wide receivers. And this is a draft that is thick with tackles and wide receivers. So that's a place that you're going to go. And, yeah. and Zach Frazier from WVU has been mentioned because the Steelers need a center. If he's there in round two or three, that may be a draft pick as well. Yeah, and there's Jackson Powers Johnson, the center from Oregon, too. I could see them yeah. taking wide receiver, too. Brian Thomas, Jr. from LSU. A.D. Mitchell from Texas. JPJ, I think, will be gone before the Steelers pick. There are some injury concerns. Well, whatever I wouldn't they be concerned do, as fall, long as they beat fall. the Ravens, Dylan, that's all that matters. <laughs> here, here now. <laughs> the Ravens are going to draft Jordan Morgan, offensive tackle from Arizona. Mark it in now. All right, you got it. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a marvelous day. Thank you, guys.